Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Hometown History. This is episode 2.9, Martin Library tricked the Great Depression to offer treats for generations. I am Jamie. And I'm Dami. And tonight we are at the Martin Library. So a little bit about me. Um, my name is Jamie Norpel and I am a high school history teacher. That's what I do for my day job. And then the evenings, uh, Jim and I run a website called Witnessing York and I have a local history blog called Wondering in York County. And I'm Dami, and during the day, I am the Third Circuit Court of Appeals Librarian for the Middle District of Pennsylvania. I run a group called Preserving the History of Newburytown, and I'm a Civil War reenactor in my spare time. You're cool. So Martin Library is the theme of tonight, and we're going to focus on this for our main bar. But if you stay tuned around 630, we are going to have our interview, our extra. Yeah, Mina Edmondson from Martin Library is going to be joining us for our extra. And later tonight, we will also have a short on the history of Kreitz Creek. It's a fascinating story. Mm -hmm. They almost didn't open. Same with Martin Library. It was not as easy as what everyone thinks. The challenge has been very difficult along the way. So Martin Library opened in 1935, and it was during the Great Depression. Uh, I like to picture Halloween trick-or-treaters, you know, running through the doors. What would they have dressed up like? Definitely would be no, like, Mario Kart or, I don't know, what are kids dressing up like these days? Um, Marvel characters. Mar yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Um, they would have been like, I'm thinking black cats or pumpkins. ghosts. Lots of pumpkins. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so they would have opened up the wooden doors, the brand new wooden doors, for the very first time for Martin Library. Um, but the tricky launch of the new, new library at the height of the Great Depression had been successful, and it was a very big treat, and it was a win, a win for York County because the books offered a diversion during the Great Depression. It provided something for people to go and read to escape, you know, what was happening to them. But opening wasn't easy. We experienced many roadblocks. And some at Halloween opening likely remember um, that this uh, opening was actually delayed. So even during better economic times, about 30 years earlier, some York readers pursued the Carnegie Library. Um, and Carnegie even offered us a library, but we turned it down because it was going to cost us too much money. Yeah. So that's just one example of York's backward attitude towards libraries. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that as many uh, hurdles that we had to take on, uh, many more fought for 13 libraries across the county. Um, and these, uh, and three post-secondary colleges and co-opportunities for children like the Keystone space that we have in York now. Yeah, so that's amazing. Cool. So um, York County was late to the scene in regards to education, but it's been anything but a waste. Yeah. Uh, the Martin Library showcases our hustle and our vision for the future. This mindset continues with the $6 million renovation this year. Uh, renovations of all three libraries, Martin, Red Lion, and Hellum. And on Halloween, people came in costumes. Yeah. So that's really cool. And it's always been creative at attracting visitors with engaging experiences. And libraries empower us through access to knowledge. And as a community, uh, we see what we can do moving forward with the libraries and education in New York County. So these are our three takeaways. We may have been late to education, but mm -hmm. we're here now and that's yes. what counts. Uh, Martin Library was our visionary for York County. Mm -hmm. And then also libraries today are a place of empowerment. Absolutely. So our agenda, we're going to start with Hanover, then we're going to get into how we turn down Carnegie, get into the opening of Martin Library, mm -hmm. and then finish with the current day renovations. So to start, let's dive down into Hanover. Uh, Hanover is where we're filming our next episode, yes. and we're going to the Arts Guild. But this is one of the first public libraries in York County. Um, this would have been down in uh, Hanover in 1911, so before mm -hmm. World War II, before World War I, women couldn't vote yet, so it was a very different time. Yes. Um, there was an article in the York Dispatch that I found from 1918 that said that the actual first public library in Hanover dated way before that, almost 100 years in 1816. That's amazing. Right, but it didn't look like this. It was more of a private residence. Um, there were a thousand people who lived in the town at the time, and together they purchased 3,000 books on history, language, science, biographies, theology, literature, fiction. And again, that was the 1800s. Right. And along came this one then in the 1900s. So for the first time, people in Hanover had access to information. And just to put it in perspective, this is before we had cell phones and computers <laughs> and the internet. So this is where you went for knowledge. 
Um, today, we can Google almost anything we right. want and, and we take that for granted. That information is so accessible to us. But back then, you were limited to the few books that you had in your house. They were relatively expensive or the people that you could talk to, your social network. Right. But now that we had the library, you could go down and uncover almost anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, people would have gone to the encyclopedia. That would have been where they found their credible sourcing. Yeah, and you only had access to the books that you could actually afford right. until the library. Right. So this is then what it looks like now, um, and it is quite an impressive structure. It is, yeah. Yep. So knowledge was restricted before the library, but a the library revolutionized the education process. And like I said, you know, you were limited to what you could afford. So if you couldn't yeah. afford a large collection of books, you couldn't afford to learn to a lot learn. of knowledge. You couldn't yeah. afford to learn, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. Yeah. Um, so now people could read as much as they wanted free of charge. Yeah, and that's amazing. So expansions and re re renovations, I can't talk tonight. In the early 2000s prompted community members to question the importance of spending so much money on public library systems. Um, so the libraries tripled in size and they focused mainly on the children's part of the library and $3 million was raised by the library, um, but the borough still paid about 600,000 a year until 2026 on these renovations. So there was, you know, some cost to the mm -hmm. community, yeah. but they were able to raise a lot of the money on their own. And it was renamed the Guthrie Memorial Library after Hanover attorney Lewis T. Guthrie. Um, however, as a librarian and educators, we feel that it's important to vest in free access for information. So in 2003, the National Center for Education Statistics reported that 12% of York Countyans lack basic literary, literacy skills and struggle to read a paragraph. Yeah. So, and you're going to compare that to 15% in Lancaster, 13% in Adams. And as a whole, Pennsylvania has 13% um, that lack basic literacy skills. And this shows that we need to invest in, um, you know, free education and mm -hmm. public libraries throughout the community. And we need to be really dedicated to reading yeah. and what that means for our education. When I was in college, York College requires that you volunteer downtown so you get experience in urban communities. Mm -hmm. And I chose the Martin Library, and so we would be <laughs> down here. I spent 30 hours, and I remember helping um, the little ones with flashcards on math, you know, just how to, how to use math, and also mm -hmm. like basic reading. And I'm so grateful for that opportunity, because right. it taught me like how to be patient, number one, uh, <laughs> that I don't want to teach elementary school kids. I love them but I'm definitely <laughs> meant for high school um, but then also that it was like free you know and volunteers came and, mm -hmm. and it was a part of what makes our community so great mm. right yeah I did my um, graduate internship here at Martin Library in the teen space oh cool and it was amazing that it was a free safe place for the teenagers to come after school and on weekends yep. and they had educational opportunities in the library mm -hmm. or you know just a safe social group yeah you can always count on the library you can. Here. yeah yep. absolutely yeah. now that though is a relatively new new phenomenon for our ancestors a hundred mm -hmm. years ago they could not count on the library so back in 1900 Andrew Carnegie he was the steel tycoon he mm -hmm. was spreading information around the world through building these libraries mm -hmm. um, and so he uh, chose a lot of libraries in America to build about 2,000 right the uh, mayor at the time mm -hmm. in New York his name was Merrick Geis and he wrote Carnegie a letter and he said, I'm looking for a large donation to build York County's first library. Because again, this is 1900, right. before Hanover. Carnegie responds to little old York County <laughs> and says, absolutely, I will support you. I will give you $50,000, which at the time- a huge sum of right? money. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But he did have contingencies. It wasn't just gonna be a free 50,000. We had to provide the land, and then we also had to have $5,000 secured in an account to pay for the maintenance of the library and to restock it with books. Um, originally, the mayor at the time said, okay, we can do this. He found the money to buy the property, so we had the land. But then when it was time to send it to council to decide if we were going to raise the 5000 for the yearly sum, um, they decided that they did not like it. Those taxes, those darn taxes were too much. $5,000 was more than they were willing to pay, so we actually turned down this opportunity of a Carnegie Library. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yep. But it all worked out in the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, there are some theories as to why it initially got turned down too. Yeah, June Lloyd assumes that the raising taxes turned the city off to the idea. And then York High School offered to provide a separate room, a 27 by 37 foot room with 5,000 volumes of books available to the general public. So if we're thinking what we said, 3,000 books were in available Hanover. in the original lending library. So 5,000 books in New York City, that was a lot. And then newspapers reported that it opened in March of 1900. York's first free public library. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know if you want to call that the first free public library. It was in a room in the high school, you know, just tucked in the back. We're, we're not quite sure how that would have looked if we count that as public or free or not. Yeah, but I mean, it was a library. So community struggled to understand the Dewey Decimal System. So, and I can tell you as a working librarian, even though I work with law clerks and we use the Library of Congress system, the Dewey Decimal System still stumps adults today <laughs> and children alike. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're not using it every day I can understand right, why right. and then the York Daily said although there is only a nucleus of what York's public library should be it is a very good beginning yep I have to agree with them yeah and Carnegie couldn't have been too angry because a representative came in 1911 to help the new Hanover library yeah. so that was nice of him yeah Robert Bliss assistant secretary to the state public library commission in Harrisburg and Miss A. F. Greer from the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh visited the Hanover library to consult and help them so they did reach out a helping hand after yeah. all even though we turned them down yeah and even though we didn't take their money we did take their help their free help we did, so yeah. that was good um we want to point out that what makes it so i read this fabulous book um my husband luke didn't love it as much but it's called <laughs> guns germs and steel i read that too so good right uh, no oh okay. <laughs> i loved it why didn't you like it uh, it was too long. It was a summer reading assignment for AP World oh, History. Yeah, Hi, Mr. <laughs> Kerstetter at Redland High School. Yeah, I think we all fell asleep reading that book. Oh. That year, well, he goes through Jared Nyman, if I remember correctly. I think so. Um, he goes through the history of the human species and how we evolve from hunter and gatherers to civilization to where we are now. I listened to the audiobook. Is that I, cheating? No. Good. No, I mean, the library gives out audiobooks, so no, but I read it, so maybe yeah. that's why it was so boring. <laughs> I look at it as running on a treadmill, like, you're, you are running, you're picking up your feet, but the treadmill is just kind of moving underneath Yeah, it helps you along. Yeah. So he discussed a lot in his book about the evolution of writing and how it changed our society. So mm -hmm. um, historians think that humans started speaking together two million years ago, so the first the discovery of Homo sapiens, that's when we started speaking. Mm -hmm. um, but then in Mesopotamia, which is current day Iraq, that was the beginning of agriculture, where right. we have people that were hunters and gatherers that decide that we are going to settle down in one spot. They had accumulated enough plants and animals to justify not having to move around and being nomadic and staying in one location. Mm -hmm. But with that, though, also became very challenging because right. now you're responsible for things. Mm -hmm. As a hunter and gatherer, you can just pick up your stuff and move. You're not committed. But if you're settling the land mm -hmm. and you're planting crops, then and you have an investment in the future. So this is the beginning of agriculture and also mm -hmm. the beginning of writing because they needed bookkeeping right. to be able to keep track of how many things they planted and how they were mm -hmm. harvesting and the exchange of money as well. So that was the beginning of writing. Yep. Right, so now instead of passing down information orally, um, changing as a person adjusted the narration slightly. We can all remember the game of telephone. Each person that gets the new information is gonna change it just a little bit. Yeah. Um, individuals and communities could document a world's worth of information by writing it down. Additionally, with agriculture came more free time. Instead of every person needing to find his or her own sustenance and going out and hunting and gathering, um, a few members of society took on that role, leaving time and intellectual freedom to explore theology, government, and the yeah. sciences. And today in the 21st century, we see the indispensability of this dissemination of knowledge. So before free access to information, your occupational future relied on your parents. Um, you followed in their line of work, and now we can be anything that we want to be. Um, a huge part of that is being able to teach ourselves so much that I chose my own career. My parents worked for DuPont, actually, um, and I, none of my family were big readers. And then mm. I came home from school one day and said, I'm going to be a librarian. <laughs> how, how old were you? Um, I was in high school. I started uh, volunteering for the York County Library System when I was in 11th grade, hmm. actually, uh, one of my best friends in high school volunteered for the Redland Library, and I said, I think that would oh. be fun, and I wanted to do that too, so I started volunteering on Thursday nights, yeah. and then 
graduated and went to library college, and here I am. <laughs> well, you have your undergraduate and your master's library in library science. science and information studies. Yeah, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it, and I think more people should be librarians. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Same with me. My family, um, my stepdad's family, has a lot of educators in it. But as mm -hmm. far as like my dad's side and my mom's side, I am the only teacher. I think I just found it organically. Right. But it was so nice that I had that option. You know, whereas mm -hmm. before, if you didn't have writing, you had to just listen to what your social network said, your parents said, or your friends. So you were just, you know, stuck in whatever groove they set out for you. Yeah, it was almost like if you were born on a farm, you were raised on the right. farm, you worked for the farm, right. and yeah. the circle kept continuing. <laughs> um, so now we are going into the third part of our presentation tonight, getting into Martin Library, where we are tonight, and its history. So here's a picture, like we showed you, of what it looked like when it first opened. It doesn't look that different. I was just going to say that. No, I love that type of architecture too. It's timeless. Yeah, they've taken care of it. Mm -hmm. um, so this, so just to set the tone, we're in the Great Depression. Um, the unemployment rate across the country is 25%. So one in four people can't find jobs. Um, even in York County, it was a struggle. People were always self-sufficient in our neck of the woods, but it was still not as easy, you know. Um, there's a lot of talk of people who ate dandelions during this time period because they couldn't mm -hmm. afford their own food but the library this was this beacon of hope for people where they could go and just escape you know pick right. up a book and start reading or if they had the attitude of I need to figure out a new job like where do I even get started you can mm -hmm. go to the library um, so interestingly enough libraries become more popular during recessions mm -hmm. so when the economy is not doing well people start going to the library more so Fingers crossed, hopefully we don't go into another recession, but at least people will be visiting the library, so right. that's good. <laughs> um, because it was no cost or you know these low cost diversions to right. be able to come around. Yep. And it wasn't just Martin Library too um, that was able to open its doors during the Great Depression. We also had York Little Theater. Mm -hmm. oh, well, any guesses? What other things opened during the Great Depression, which would have been 1929 to around 1939? Here's your hint. There is um, music involved. It's close. They play a lot in the Appel Theater. Someone said it. Yes, the York Symphony Orchestra opened during the Great Depression. Um, same with Christmas Attics as well. Yep. And uh, we also encourage you guys to, at the end, uh, York County Economic Alliance gave us some funds to purchase merch. So we have these really fancy pens. They even have the stylist at the tip. So if anybody asks questions at the end of our presentation, we'll happily give you a pen to be thinking about the questions that you want to ask us. If we can't answer it, our amazing uh, uh, co-host, Jim McClure, who's always in the background, but is the mastermind behind everything, will be able to help us and if you're online watching if you comment with questions we'll figure out how to get you a pen we'll meet you downtown somewhere along the way everybody gets a pen <laughs> So Martin was among a group of 765 new libraries that opened between 1930 and 1940, which is an amazing number. Across the country. Yeah, across the country. And it's opening place York within 60% of Americans served by public libraries by 1935. From the strong start and weak financial times, Martin Library continued to grow. They even provided bookside services to York Hospital residents, yeah, which cool. was so nice. Yeah. You know, it's not just an in-house operation. And one of FDR's New Deal programs included Work Progress Administration. The WPA employed millions of unemployed people, mostly not formally educated, who worked on public works projects as uh, such as construction, and they also came here to the Martin yeah, Library. Right here, WPA, yeah. Martin Library. For nine months, two workers contributed to Martin Library for 25 hours a week. These were superior workers and fitted into our program perfectly, so well that they asked one of them to work for the library permanently, yeah. so it turned into a permanent job. This is one of those like cool history moments where we were looking on newspapers.com of the history of Martin Library, and mm -hmm. you always hear about the New Deal and the WPA, yeah. but then when you actually see like the WPA was in York County, right here in Martin Library, I'm like, man, that's so cool, like how everything is connected. It was. He yeah. was on to something. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Um, but uh, this probably won't surprise you. York Countyans always aren't full-fledged believers in uh, visions and open to change. Uh, we tend to like where things are. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of skeptics who thought that when the library opened that uh, the novelty would wear off. 
that people would want to stop coming right. um, and that the visitations would drop dramatically. And this would prove that the demand for the library in the county, quote, was not as nearly as great as some people said it was. They were wrong. Within the first three days, three days, 7,505 people walk through the doors that you walk through tonight. That's a lot of people. Yeah, that is a lot of people. So we may have been late to the scene. Uh, libraries were across the count, uh, country at this time. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't open ours until the Great Depression. But it was anything but a waste, even though people were skeptical. It was totally worth it. Right. But skepticism wasn't the only issue. So it was also during the 1930s that leaders pointed out another problem. York County was one of the richest agricultural and industrial centers of the Commonwealth. However, county commissioners denied people in rural communities access to the public libraries closer to their houses. Uh, just like the success of urban dwellers with Martin Library, the country folk would find value in libraries uh, further dispersed among the country. Uh, the bookmobile helped with this. Yes, so the 1930s and the 1940s, bookmobiles were a way to get books out to the rural areas. So they were taking them out of the library, putting them on these vans and taking them out to the countryside. And But it's better late than never. Better late than never. Which should be York's motto. <laughs> <laughs> better late than never. Um, another thing that this, this surprised and I found uh, very interesting about this research is that um, York County has not always had the best reputation with being the most educated. And right. we're going to show you two examples of that. Um, one is the um, Hex murder trial of 1929. So York County made international news because mm -hmm. of the murder of a suspected, suspected witch. Um, someone who practiced powwow in York County. And when it made the news associated in the newspaper, reporters noted that York was a town without a public library. So you're picking up the news, you're reading about a murder uh, of a suspected witch, and you're thinking about this county that's the whole way in the middle of nowhere. And then mm -hmm. you read down there, oh, by the way, and they have no library. So what message is that sending? They're uneducated. They're uneducated, that we don't care about you know, teaching ourselves, that we're stuck in superstition mm -hmm. and tradition and we're not open to new ideas. Another thing that happened um, was thinking about education as a whole in 1970. So who was alive in 1970? Yeah, I know half of you were alive, but some of you were like, yes, I was, 1970. Um, the graduation rate in York County was 45%. Graduation rate for high school, 45%. Yep. We also did not have a four-year college, as Dami already said. Right. Uh, to put it in perspective, Lancaster had three. And we also, like we've already said, library did not exist in the city until 1935. Hanover was 1911. Mm -hmm. So we've been playing catch up uh, with education ever since. That's like, the, again, the theme of tonight, playing catch up. Yeah, it kind up. of has been. Better late than never. <laughs> yep, yep. But that brings us to the York County Library System, which Martin is a part of. And that was created in 1974, Independent Private Nonprofit Corporation. Uh, libraries are in Dillsburg, Glenrock, New Freedom, Spring Grove, York Haven, Brogue, Dover. I could All go over. On. Yeah. Yes. And today we have 13 full service libraries, two pick up and drop off locations, and a neighborhood library in York City's Salem Square neighborhood. There are over 600,000 print and digital items for loan and use for Yay. free through the library. We've arrived. We're yeah. here. We have 19, 19 libraries. 1974 <laughs> is when it all started. <laughs> So where did Martin Library get its name? So this guy right here, the dude with the killer mustache, his name was Milton Martin. Very impressive mustache. Yeah, and um, we are building off of the work of Stephen Smith, by the way. He's another local historian who researched this already. He got into the carriage making business. So there are a few of his carriages that you can see that would have been popular uh, in York and elsewhere. And at first it didn't succeed, but try, try again. He kept on working at his carriage business. And eventually a receipt from 1893 indicates that his two factories, which I do have a picture of there, that is one of his factories, they were pumping out 12,000 vehicles annually. 12,000 carriages made right here in York County, Very which is impressive. pretty cool. Yeah. Yep. Going back, there's another picture of the carriage as well. Um, so he, oh, by the way, um, commissions um, uh, John Dempwolf to help him build his house. And there you could recognize the house and how you can still see it outside. There you can see the uh, current day picture. Yep. So he was riding on a train one day. So he's, he's building this carriage business, making lots of money, 
born and raised in New York County. He travels with his wife. His wife's name is Martha. Mm -hmm. And they're on a train far away from New York County. And while he's talking to someone on the train, someone asks, um, Martin, uh, where are you from? And he says, oh, I'm from New York County. And their response was, isn't that the place without a library? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> he was like, okay, now I need to do something about it. So after that, that's when we figured out he donated all this money. Yeah, so after Martin died in 1912, his estate went to his wife, Martha, and she died in 1915. And that's when we learned that Milton's donation of $125,000 went toward public libraries, and Martha added an additional $60,000 to that. Today, that's the equivalent of $5.5 million. Oh, to the library. That's a lot of money mm -hmm. for a library. Yeah. <laughs> However, that wasn't enough to build and stock a library, so they invested the money to accumulate more funds. And by 1920, enough money was accured uh, to purchase the lot on the southwest corner of East Market and North yeah. Queen Streets, where Martin Library now stands. So thank you to yeah. Milton and Martha. And in 1934, another local architect, Dempwolf, uh, it was actually John's son, Frederick, designed the colonial style library and it opened in 1935 on Halloween Eve. It's like a spooky night to yeah, open. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so here is a picture of the first um, staff that worked at Martin Library, and we also want to thank them sincerely from the bottom of our heart for allowing us to stay here tonight. Right. It is past closing time, and they have agreed to keep their doors open, so we're very thankful for that. Um, but this was the first people who worked here. So the first staff, Miss um, Shorey, she was the second from the right at the rear, and her youngest sister Priscilla, who she raised actually, she is center rear, um, they are part of the staff, and Shorey, she was the very first librarian, and she worked here for 35 years, so until 1970. So very if you remember coming to the library before 1970, don't wanna, uh, <laughs> not sure how old our audience is, but uh, <laughs> you might remember Miss Shorey. But she was known for warmly greeting people when they came in and being very welcoming. Um, people who were ready to read, she's kind of set the tone of like, welcome to the library. Like, we're so happy you're here. Um, we, you know, what can we help you find? Yeah. yeah. And um, today we are also uh, led by Robert Lampert. He is one of, what is his role again? Direct He's the director of the entire library system. Good. I'm the so president. The president. Yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, we have our uh, resident expert in libraries <laughs> in New York County here, which is great. So he started working here when he was in the high school. He did, yeah. And, and now he leads the system. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I love how we keep we keep a lot of people in your county. Like, we do, yeah. yeah. We have a high retention rate. <laughs> so now we're ending with uh, the, the last part of tonight's presentation. Yeah, the renovations that happened to the library that we're in today. So a $6 million renovation began in the fall of 2021, and the official opening was in 2022. So if you think about it, the library was opened during the Great Depression. We were working mm -hmm. toward that, and then we undertook in a major renovation during COVID, at the yes. height of the COVID oh, pandemic. Oh, wow, yeah. Right? Huh. Yeah. So um, to better serve young people, updated security systems and restrooms were installed, and they added new public spaces. New windows that looked like the old ones, but were more modern and had better efficiency. And then a centerpiece of the renovation is the new teen space on the second floor, which I love because like I said, I spent my entire internship in the teen space. So it's so cool to see it updated. Um, it includes a table, game area, a lounge, laptop, plug-in spaces, and a computer lab. Um, recording, audiovisual, and a DJ lab. That's cool. That's very That's really cool. cool. Yeah, and there's a separate glass-walled area that will offer equipment and training. Mm -hmm. There's a solver space for making things to solve problems while creating, mm -hmm. so like a maker lab. And then there's a photo from 1935 that shows the original reading room. I, I mean, like things have changed, but also it kind of hasn't. I know, and you know, when it's that beautiful, you don't really need to right? change it. Yeah. yeah, you get your table and you get to sit and you start reading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here's what it looks like today as a comparison, but you, I'm sure you've seen it when you walked in. It's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, so right now we're in the kids' space. So here's a picture of what it looks like. If I was a kid, I'd love to run around. Oh, it's <laughs> one of the coolest children's <laughs> libraries. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Play. Um, Jim McClure pointed out that they purposely inset the staff of the children's area so they would be a foot or two lower. Mm -hmm. So when the kids came to check out the book, they could look at the staff in the eye. That's cute. What a small little detail. It's it makes great it so for kids and short adults. Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, one thing we also wanted to point out is Loran Jacobs. She is known for being a um, sculptress around. She designs uh, the Tin Man there. Uh, she's also my grandma, so she's super cool. <laughs> I was going to say, how do you know I her, know, Jamie? right? Yeah. Um, I, I always say this. I got zero of her talent. It has been too diluted. I am not good at making anything art. I'm a historian and a researcher. That's what I do. Um, but she told me a story about how her mom, which was my Nana, her name was Jean Gickness, would bring her into the library, you know, when she was growing up in the 60s and 70s. And she remembers seeing the turtle baby, which is a sculpture that you can see on your way out. Um, it's a child that's holding two turtles. And she just remembers being a child, looking at the sculpture, just thinking how beautiful it was. Mm -hmm. And that was the inspiration behind her entire career. This is what she's done now for the past 50 years. She's designed these sculptures. And it's cool that the library was the birth of her entire like future. I love it. Yeah. I think that's yeah. so cool. So we mentioned earlier, um, and this is one of our last kind of questions before we, we summarize today's takeaways, is that um, human history has changed and writing and reading has changed human history. But I am a teacher and I have noticed that a lot of students aren't reading quite as much. They still read for sure. I'm not one of those like, what are our kids doing today? Like our kids are great, right? They're doing awesome. Um, but reading isn't quite as a priority. Right. I mean, even, do you know the birth of hometown history, why we started making videos? Because people weren't reading our articles. And we thought, how can we bring our content to people in a different medium so people are still consuming um, local history in a way that beats them? So if you're watching this video, awesome, but also books are cool too. So let's, let's also <laughs> read as well. Right. Um, but are, are we losing our literacy? I hope not. Yeah, what's, what's happening? I'm not sure. Yep. Um, one thing that I know about the library and uh, teaching the next generation how to read uh, an announcement, if you didn't know already, but uh, my husband and I are having a baby. Yay! Yay. Thanks, so excited, our next co-host. Yes. Uh, we are 14 weeks along. April is our due date, um, and so we will be coming to the library for sure because we want to, just like my great-grandma brought my grandma and my mom brought me, we want to continue that. The newest Martin Library patron. Yeah. <laughs> so our takeaways from today. So your county was late to the scene in regard to education, but it's been anything but a waste. The Martin Library showcases our hustle and our vision for the future. And this mindset continues with the $6 million renovations that happened here at Martin. And Redline and Helm also had renovations. And then Halloween, people came in costumes. We've always been creative at attracting visitors with engaging experiences. And, you know, we've connected it to trick-or-treating even, yeah. which I think is cool. And libraries empower us through the access to knowledge. As a community, let's see how we can do it moving forward. If you would like to watch more of our videos, we're on YouTube and Witnessing York. And then our next episode will be November 17th, open mm -hmm. to the public. We will be down in Hanover. We haven't ventured to that uh, corner right. of the county yet. Um, that'll be at 7 o'clock down at the Arts Guild. So thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions before we... Yes. I have a friend who is an avid fan of um, Martin Library, and she has since moved to Kalispell, Montana. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. If she was visiting, she'd be here tonight. Oh, I love it. But is there any way that she can see this episode tonight online? Yeah, so the question was, um, she has a friend that moved to Montana but loves the library. How can she watch it online? So um, you're here in person, but we're also filming live on Facebook as we speak. And you can view it through the Retro York or the Preserving the History of Newburytown Facebook pages. We also download our videos and then upload them to our YouTube page called Hometown History with yeah. Jamie and Dami. And if you're not on Facebook, you can just email us and we'd be happy to email you those links. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and she is as well. Okay. Oh, cool. Yeah. 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 We want them to be as widely accessible as possible. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else have any questions? Yes. Well, I'm older than Dirk, and I remember using the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any libraries that still use that? So the question is, do libraries still use the Dewey Decimal System? Yes, they almost all still use the Dewey Decimal System. Public libraries use the Dewey Decimal System and government medical libraries use the Library of Congress system. And the Library of Congress library uses the Library of Congress system. Um, but any public library you're going to go into is cataloged with the Dewey Decimal System. So if you know it, you don't have to relearn anything. <laughs> Anyone else? This might be a question more from back here. Um, has the Martin Library uh, had to shut down to the public for extended periods of time at any point? We did during, during okay. COVID, but we maintained 
services online as well. So we made sure that we were able to continue to connect with the community. Okay, so the question was, has the Marne Library had to close down for long periods of time? And the answer was that during COVID, yes, they had to shut down to the public, but they maintained access to the materials and were able to serve the communities in different ways, even if the people weren't able to come into the library physically. Online. Yeah, online is a great way to access library materials. Great. Well, thank you all. Appreciate you coming. Uh, we are going to have our interview next for our extra. So feel mm -hmm. free to hang out. No commitment, though. Uh, we know it's getting late, but yes. thank you all very much. Thank you. Yeah.